That was great. Can we say thank you to our worship team? So good. So good. We are blessed, church. We are blessed. Come on. Hey, come on. Turn with me, please. Psalm 140, uh, 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. This is kind of the pregame to the message, and this is just from worship, and just, man, I want you to get this. I want you to know this. If we just, if we just take even just this one verse. Church, have you ever had just had a verse, like a verse? It's just like, ah, oh, that's everything to me. Like the famous John 3, 16. Everybody knows it. Life-changing, salvation, amazing. It's incredible. But what happens when you look at a Psalm 145, verse 3, and you just say, okay, I want to highlight this, man. I want to make this my verse for the week. Man, I need to get into this and dive into this. It's so simple. And it just simply says this, great is the Lord and highly to be praised for his greatness is unsearchable. What happens when you just take that? And we're singing in our time of worship is this time of celebration, this time of true worship and adoration to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. And we, we do believe this, for great is the Lord, for he is great. The word great is this, this word of magnitude, this word that is just a big, big God, like great, magnitude, large, great is our God, speaks of authority and power, great is our God, highly to be praised. Or your version may say, greatly to be praised. The word praise is halal. This is where we get hallelujah. This is where we get celebration. This is, this is our moment to put God in the spotlight that we are truly all about him. And we put him in the spotlight and we celebrate him. And there's this sense of true honor and celebration to one who's in the spotlight. That's what this word praise means. Great is the Lord. Highly or greatly to be praised for his greatness is unsearchable. So we know that God is great. We know that God is, is, is magnitude, like it's big. God is great. And his praise should be great. And his greatness, that which we're talking about, his greatness is unsearchable. And amazing that when you, when you know I'm a believer, man, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know that the Bible is true and I know that my God is great and I know that he is the creator of all things that God created the heaven and the earth in six days. He spoke, bang, it became, you want to talk about a bang theory? There it is, like bang, light showed up. Sun, moon, stars showed up. Things that fly and things that swim and then he put dirt together and breathed on it and here we are. Like that's God in his greatness. But when you know all that, you're like, Wow! And then the depth of his true greatness is unsearchable. I can never get to the bottom of truly how great he is, even though I see it and I experience it and it's right before us. And, and we, we know that the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Just the heavens are telling of his magnitude and his excellence and radiance and his brilliance. And the stars are declaring the work of his hands. Just by the stars existing, they are telling of God's ability. But church, we can never have the depth of understanding of just truly how great and powerful our God is until I believe that when we get to go home in the new heaven and the earth or, or if we get to go home and, and just see the magnitude and be able to see God face to face, man, I think there's gonna be a moment in every human being that who knows and loves Jesus that will stand before God Almighty and be like, ha, oh, wow, yeah, that, that, wow. When the Bible said, great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised for your great as I see, Yes, you are great. I think there's going to be a moment for us. I believe this. There's going to be a moment for us that we're just like, oh, wow, wow, wow. If, if I had known, I mean, I, 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 I think there'll be a piece to that for probably all of us, but I don't want it to be on a big scale because we are called to know based off of his beautiful creation and his greatness that our God is all-powerful church and this is why we worship the way we do. And I hope that you find this verse on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and you come back in the house on Sunday and you're inviting people and you're ready and you're juiced and you're ready to truly put God in the spotlight and give him a praise that is worthy because he is God Almighty. Come on, on a count of three, we're gonna give him a praise that is worthy. Come on, one, two, three. Come on, 11. Come on, 11. There we go. Hallelujah. Come on, Lord, bless our time in your word. We thank you for your word. We love your word. 
God, I ask that you would speak to us in this moment. God, speak to us from your word this morning. God, I pray that we are hungry for your word. God, I pray that we devour it today. That we, God, we just allow you to just do something within our spirits today. God, I pray that you would awaken us in this moment today as you speak to us in Jesus' name. Come on, amen. All right, all right, here we go. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. In that church, we know that uh, if you are an NFL fan, amen. If you're not a football fan, uh, you're learning. It's incredible. Um, but Monday night, last Monday night, we saw something, uh, something take place that it just kind of, it was one of those moments that kind of stopped sports. And, and it's been one of those moments that, that kind of stopped sports altogether. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you saw the shift of this nation begin to pray. All of a sudden, you, you begin to see this shift of, of people actually praying even on TV. You saw sportscaster praying on TV and praying in God's name. And, and, it's, and it was, it's, it's something that's been incredible and wonderful and beautiful. And at the same time, for me personally, kind of a cautionary thing only because of this, and I want, I want us to know this, that when, when, when there is a true call to pray in this nation years ago, Years ago, a call to pray in this nation was a call to pray to the one true living God. We knew that as a nation. For under God, right? This nation under God. This nation under God. We knew God that we were praying to. And I just want us to know as a church, man, it is my hope and it is my desire and it has been the prayer of my household that, that Mr. Uh, DeMar Hamlin gets up out of that bed and walks out of the hospital. I've been praying that he begin to play football again. And it is to the Lord's credit and God is the one who receives the glory and honor. And I pray that my man DeMar gets out of the hospital bed and he just begins to glorify and praise the one true living God and the one who actually answered the prayer, the, the really believing that God, you had your hand on all of, all of the trainers that were on the field. You have your hand, God, in the wisdom of the doctors that brought them back to life. You had your hand on the, like there's so much, but it is truly to God be the glory. For those who don't understand, pray. If they're praying to a tree, a tree had nothing to do with this. Right? If you're praying to the sun God, he had nothing to do with this. There is no such thing. He's a dead God. There is one and only one true living God who inclines his ear and leans in because he's interested in what we have to say. And that is our true one living God, the God of all power and might, the God who spoke the heavens and the earth in the beginning. And in the beginning, and it is God Almighty, our creator. He is the one who's listening and he is the one who will answer and he is the one and only one who should be getting the credit. It is not just this nationwide and worldwide prayer for praying to a tree. The tree's not doing anything. Just so we get this thing clear that we want God to receive all the credit if his hand's in his healing. Come on, amen? 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 Come on, keep praying for this young man. We are excited as this has just been a wonderful week in the sense of people coming back to prayer again, but I want to make sure that we know prayer is powerful, but prayer has to be to a sense of the one true living God and nowhere else. And I love this. And man, church, there is a slight chance this would be amazing. If, if, if it would be to God's glory, there is a very slight chance after today's football games that the Pittsburgh Steelers actually play the Buffalo Bills in the playoffs. Slight chance. It's a possibility. I'm a DeMar Hamlin fan. Doesn't mean I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. Everybody wants to go red, white, and blue to support the Bills. Ah, and I'm hoping in one week. I am hope. Wouldn't that... Wouldn't that be amazing? Y'all thought we stunk, and then all of a sudden, there's a chance, and you're nervous. It's amazing to know that you're a little nervous going, wow, if this actually happens. Like, they're, I'm just saying, Daddy-O. It would be incredible. Woo! Okay, come on, let's preach. Come on. Second Peter chapter 1. As you know, we are in uh, this little, uh, we'll probably hopefully get done with it today, and we are looking at what it means to, to live godly among the godless. What's it mean to live godly? A couple definitions here. We, you know, we need to know what it means to live godly, and we need to know what the godless look like. We need to know what it means to live godly. You hear it constantly from Believer's Chapel. Two teams. You're either of the Father, you're the devil, or you're of the, the Father Jesus, like Father God. You're either of the devil, you're either of Jesus. You're in two camps, one or the other. There's only two. Jesus, Satan. That, that's the only two. And when you really see how in a generation we live in right now, you see this, you see this John 8, 44, where Jesus is speaking of the father, the devil, and he is speaking in a way going, listen, you are of your father, the devil. He is a murderer. He is a liar. His, his very nature to lie for everything he says can't be true because he is a liar. And guess what? Please hear me, man. The, the devil is, is the best liar deceiver of all time. 
always will. That's what he does. That is who he is. That is his nature. I mean, when you see, okay, I am in a generation right now of what does it really look like for those who are called to live godly among the godless and to see, I don't know, listen, I'm 53 years old. Uh, we look and we see where in my time, and I'm, and I, I'm even looking to those who are older than I, lived in even a, a different time period, even 20 years older, 30 years older, and you can attest, I'm guessing because I've heard that it's probably the most confusing time that we've lived in for this generation. They don't really know um, the reality of how confusing it is right now. Like with all of the easy sin and with all of the, the crazy confusion and with all of the battles of same sex, with all of the battles of gender, with all of the battles of immorality, with all of the battles of abortion and all of these, like it is just, it truly is a crazy, crazy generation right now. What happens if we take 2023 and you and I come to a place to say it's time for me to understand what it means to be godly, what it means to live godly in among those who are godless in this generation that just seems to be godless. And please hear me, we, we just shouldn't, before we get into Second Peter, we shouldn't be surprised by this. This is, this is where I believe this, man. I can get excited about this because yes, we understand that it's dark. Yes, we understand that it's lawless. There's no justice right now. There's no consequences to really bad actions to very bad people. There's no consequences to that. And we're seeing where marijuana is just free. Everybody just get high and smoke weed and everybody thinks that's okay. That's not okay. You're giving your mind over to something else and God tells us to keep a sober mind. If you're in this place and you think you can just smoke weed as a believer, I'm here to tell you, you're messing your mind up. And you're killing yourself from the inside out. Well, I don't agree with that. Well, the Bible says to keep a sober mind. You can't even drive when you're high. You shouldn't anyways. That means you're not having a sober mind. Your actions are affected by that. So when you, when you try to get in to this crazy generation, as a police officer, when I got out of the academy in 1992, I went in in 91, graduated in 92. When you, when you come out of the academy, it was like marijuana. It was drugs. And it was messing people up. Now, all of a sudden, it's just every corner. Like, this is the society we live in. We have danger going on in schools with the same sex stuff and with, with all kinds of different things that are being taught and accepted. But where, where are the godly in this? But we do know that the Bible is very clear that towards the end times, I believe that we're in the end days. I believe Jesus can come any moment. I believe Jesus could come today. That'd be great. Lord, if we do play the bills, could you just wait one more week? That's all. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. And then we win in Jesus' come and I have bragging rights for eternity. It would be incredible. It would be incredible eternal bragging rights. It would be awesome. Right after the game, it would be amazing. But did you see that last game? We could say that a thousand million years from now. It would be amazing. Anyways, um, but we do know, church, we know this, that it's just, it's, it's going to get worse. It's, it's going to get lawless. Kids are going to disobey their parents at a high level. There's going to be this level of disrespect that happens in the last days. And so we shouldn't be surprised, but I also believe this in the midst, watch this, please hear me church, in the midst of all of this, our desires and our love for evangelism doesn't change. We have been an evangelistic church from day one, even before Believer's Chapel started. Every opportunity we get to preach or different places we got to go, it was about really winning people to Christ. No matter what takes place in the world, no matter what takes place in ungodliness, no matter what takes place in this generation, I do believe this, that we are in a generation that the fruit will be abundant. We are in a generation that the harvest truly is ready and ripe for picking. When they hear the gospel, they're going to identify, I don't want this. I know that I need Jesus. I know that there is sin and we're going to see people run to the cross and run to Jesus. We are in this generation that we're going to see a harvest that is so plentiful. We're going to see God move in a powerful way. The darker it gets, we're going to shine brighter lights. We're going to be a city on a hill. There's going to be people that are hungry for truth. There's going to be people that are laying down sin and repenting and believing in Jesus' name. I think at the same time in the last days that it's getting worse, I think this is an amazing opportunity for an incredible, beautiful harvest for for so many to come to the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Woo! Let's go. Come on, 2 Peter chapter 1. We covered briefly last week what it meant to be godly. And you're going to see that word several times today. You're going to see the word the ungodly several times today. 
and the contrast and the difference between them. And today we get to go into a history lesson. We're going to get, again, in 2 Peter chapter 2, we'll be there in a minute. We're going to get in Jude, uh, the, the second to last book of the New Testament. Uh, Jude, Jesus' half-brother, gives us a beautiful history lesson of what happens to the ungodly. To remind us as the evangelical church, to remind us as a church that cares desperately and loves the lost and wants to help the hurting and wants to bring people to truth in Jesus Christ, that there is, there is punishment for sin. We can't ever lose sight of that. That those who don't respond to the gospel and those who reject and stiff arm Jesus Christ as the Lord, there is eternal damnation for that. And in this day and age, church, we can't put our head in the sand and just think that doesn't exist when we see it over and over in the New Testament again as a reminder that God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Today will be a little bit of a history lesson here in a minute, but come on, let's look at this. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and the apostle of Jesus Christ. I love this. Well, you see just Simon Peter, he's the author of this. And even Simon Peter, who was, who was an apostle, he was a disciple, he was one of Jesus' hand-picked 12, and he was ready to go, right? Like Peter's that guy. Peter's top three. And, P, and watch this, when you're top three of Jesus, you think you got a name, right? And Peter says, listen, I'm a bond servant. I'm just a slave. And a part of the, the, the heavy teaching that we've had, even for the last two weeks, and we're going to continue this pattern of what is it to know that he is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. He is our rescuer. He is the Messiah. He is the one who saves. He is Yahweh who saves. And he is Lord. That means he is my master. He is my sir. He is supreme in authority. That means he has complete and total ownership of my rights. If you are truly a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, man, this, this, this game in Jesus, it begins with this place of true surrender. What's it mean to say, I surrender? What's it mean to say, you are truly my Lord? What's it mean to say, my opinion doesn't matter? Politics, truly, the opinion of politics don't really matter. Both sides are a mess right now. You, you look at the, the, the principles of people and different things and authority. Man, you look at Jesus, it's your opinion that matters. It's the word, I gotta get back to the word that matters. If I'm going to live godly among the godless, then I need to know my rightful place as a slave of Jesus. I need to know what it means that he is my Lord. And I need to know what it means of my surrender and that I would submit to him. And this is where Peter is. This is right where Peter is. He's one of the top three that walked with Jesus, saw the miracles, heard Jesus, was there at the resurrection. It's just, ah, wow, this is Peter. And he says, I'm just a slave. That's it. Simon Peter, a bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith the same kind as ours by the, un, by, I'm sorry, by the righteousness of our, our God, Savior, Jesus Christ. Look what he says in verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. And then that amazing that he's like, he's writing this in the beginning of this letter. It says, listen, grace and peace. I, I just don't want you to have grace and peace. Grace means God's favor, his kindness. We don't deserve it, but he gives it. That's his grace. And peace, last year we spent a lot of time on peace. Last year we spent a lot of time on peace. Even though it's going crazy on the outside, I'm good on the inside. Man, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, but it's crazy right now. Yeah, I know, but I'm good. But what do you mean? Like, I know all this is going on. No, I'm good. Like, I've got a peace or something in my soul that I am good. But I like what, Potter said, what Peter says here. He says, like, grace and peace, not just be added. Let it just increase. Let it be multiplied to you. Let, let it continuously grow in a rapid form of multiplication where let, let grace, let that kindness and favor of God multiply and let peace, ah, let it just overwhelm you and be multiplied to you. Watch this, in the knowledge of God and of, and of Christ our Lord. The knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And the knowledge of God and just, like church, what is it to really know? Uh, yeah, we're born again and we believe, but what is it to have that experiential knowledge? Yes, I know him. I know him because he's God. And I have this experience with God. I know that I'm born again. I know that I am saved. I know that his spirit reigns within me. And this is what Paul is saying. Listen, it is an honor for me to be the pastor of this house. And it is a privilege. And I love, I love what God is doing here. This is a very special place with just 
a ton of amazing, amazing special ministries led by incredible people who love Jesus and love people. And man, but one of my prayers, even, even just going deeper, uh, praying for the people of Believer's Chapel, including my home, my family, my house, my wife, me, my kids, my, my you know, the whole family package and the people of this house is that God, we, we want to know you. We want to, we want to be in the fullness of you. I've had an opportunity this year, got a new Bible. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I love the Bible. I don't know if I'm a humongous fan of this exact one. Um, it's hard for me to read it. The, the, my twistables go on a little differently, that kind of thing. It's crazy. But I've had a great opportunity to go through one chapter at a time for the New Testament. And man, there's just, I'm gaining so much and just rescripting it and rewriting things out and just highlighting it in a different way. Just, I'm just, I'm loving my time in this. And one of the things that just really just jumped at me was what, what it was when Peter is praying and when Paul is praying. God, that they would know you deeply. And he's writing this to the believers. God, that they would know your fullness, Ephesians. God, that they would know what it is to be complete in you. They would know what it is to be full in you. God, they would have this deep knowledge of you. Colossians, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I've been praying this for years. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. My grandmother, my nana, she prayed this over me as an infant growing up my life. This is what my nana prayed, that they will walk in a manner worthy of you, pleasing you in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God increasing in the knowledge of God, I want to know you. Church, this is more of my prayer for the people of this church, that God, we would know you, that we would go deep in you. God, we would have an understanding of you. God, we would know what it is to be complete in you, to be full. And man, when you begin to see this, it goes hand in hand with what it means to be godly what it means to walk in that devotion. As we covered last week, the word godly or godliness, it means this devotion to a reverence and a fear of God. To go deep in my, my respect and my reverence and my fear of God. It's that, it's that devotion that I have to have this high regard, to have this high respect that follows in obedience. And, and the, the end game of that is when I have this devotion to my reverence and to my respect that, that God has held in such high regard that it's played out in my holiness. It's played out in a life and a conduct that is pure. So if we understand, watch this, watch this. So we understand what it means to be godly. We must be a people, church, we must be a people who get that, that devotion. I am in, I am surrendered. He is my Lord and I am devoted to him, to my respect and to my reverence of a healthy fear of him. And then in that, that's gonna show up in my conduct. That's gonna show up in holiness. That's gonna show up in purity. So I understand that I am called to godliness. I'm called to that devotion. I'm called to that surrendered life. I'm called to that deep, holy, healthy reverence and respect of God out of a healthy fear of him. I'm called to that. And that changes my conduct so I can walk holy and pure. All of that is found in the word godliness. It's beautiful. And it's what you and I are called to. So when you see this, watch this. He says this, grace and peace be multiplied, multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and in Jesus the Lord. Seeing that his divine power, I love this, seeing that his divine power, God's divine power, his, his divine, his, his, his powerful divine, that, that is his, his creation, that is God as divine and holy, the one and only, that's what that means. God's only, his force, his power, he's almighty. What, what does that do? Seeing that his divine power, that force, that might, that strength has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And amazing that if we just believe that, if we see this going, hold on, wait a minute, God, you, by your divine power, by, by you being divine, you being the one and only true living God, that it's you, divine, holy, true God, and it's your power and it's your might and it's your force. You've given everything that I need to, to live a life of life and godliness. So, so you're saying, Peter, that I don't really, I don't really have an excuse. Because God's already given us everything that I need to live a, my life. And the word life here, it means to be fully alive. My dad was brilliant. And, and growing up in the business that he owned in Good Tidings, when they owned that, and just growing up in a home of the, one of the greatest coaches in life, my dad was a coach on many different levels, um, college coach and a life coach for me 
and my, and my brothers. And just one of the things is, Sean, are you living or existing? You breathe, but you don't live. Church, what is it to understand? You can breathe, but only exist. And Peter is saying, listen, wait a minute. No, no, wait. God has given us everything that we need. He has supplied everything that we need in his divine power, in his force, in his might, in his strength, that I can live, I can be fully alive. And everything I need to be godly. I want this to build something in our spirits, man. I want this to build something in our hearts. To say, wait a minute, I can, I can do this. I, 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 I have the ability in God Almighty to live godly among the godless. I know that I'm, I'm one of so many. I know that I am in the minority. I know that, man, there is this tide that is turning right now. And it just, it's getting uglier and uglier and uglier. And there's just this, this permission and this okay of immorality. And it's just everywhere. But I'm going to stand firm. You mean, you mean I have the ability because of God's divine power, because of the one and only true living God in his power, might, and force, that I have the ability to live life and be just alive and breathe in such a beautiful way, but yet I have the ability to live godly even if I'm the only one. I have the ability to live godly among the godless? Yes. Pertaining to life and godliness through, here it is a second time, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence who called us by his own glory, his own brilliance, his own majesty. Like this is, this is God and his brilliance and his authority and his illuminate. Like this is what glory means. And his, his excellence means his goodness. So when you, when you see this, I love this second time, by the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that, that, that is in the world by lust. We have the ability to escape the corruption that is in this world by lust. And he has given us the divine power and authority to live godly among the godless. Now watch this verse five, gets, it, gets, it gets deep here and it says this, for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith, applying, applying all diligence in your faith, applying all diligence. The word diligence here, when you see diligence in the New Testament, it's speaking about with an intensity. It's speaking about it's time to get passionate. It's time to be enthusiastic. It's time to have a zeal. It's time to be intense. That's what, that's what a diligence means. It means this, okay, I've, I've heightened my, my game, man. It's time to be aware, and it's time to be intense, and it's time to have some zeal, and to have some passion, and to have some enthusiasm. And when, when you see this, this is what it says. It's also applying all diligence in your faith. Let my faith truly be intense, let my faith have some enthusiasm, let my faith, my trust in God to, to walk in this understanding of what it is to, to raise the level of my faith in its intensity, in, it, in its zeal, in its passion. Like th that's what this is talking about. And in that supply of moral excellence, and in your moral excellence and knowledge, that's that experiential knowing. I know, I know God. I know that I am saved. I know the creator of the heavens and the earth. I am his son. He has adopted me. He's taken me on to be his own. I'm a part of his chosen. I belong to him. Like that, that's what this is talking about, right? And in your knowledge, self-control. We are called to be a people who understand what it means to be in self-control. We are called to be a people filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in that fullness of the Holy Spirit in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Like a part of that is to be in that place to say, I have the ability to say no to sin. I have the ability to overcome temptation. Temptation comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And, and then temptation isn't the sin. It's falling into that temptation. But we have the ability by our self-control because God by his spirit who reigns within us because Jesus Christ has been tempted in every way that we have been tempted in, but yet without sin. And in that, we know that we have the ability in self-control because of Jesus Christ, by the spirit of God who reigns within us to be able to say no to sin. We have that ability. And that's where we need to be in self-control. And, and in our self-control, perseverance. Like I love that perseverance comes right after self-control. 
Like you need to endure. Perseverance needs to push through. Perseverance means don't quit. Perseverance means to persevere. It means to not stop. It means to endure. To, in perseverance, here it is, godliness. In perseverance, godliness. When I'm walking in self-control, I'm walking in self-restraint. I have the ability to say no. When I'm walking in the ability to restrain, I have the ability to persevere and endure. And in my endurance, I'm going to walk in a place of godliness. I'm going to be so devoted with such a healthy, holy fear of God, with such a deep reverence that I can walk in holiness and I can walk in purity. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor un fruitful. Watch this. For in the knowledge of God, third time, for in the true knowledge of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. Second time. Like I've got, I got diligent highlighted in green. Second time I've got diligent highlighted in green and I've got a green line going from one diligent to the next to go, okay, wow, Peter's serious about this because he puts in the first part of this letter and he nails it twice. Peter's serious about a knowledge of God because in the first few verses, he hits it three times. Like, th this is how we need to be studying the word. This is how we need to be into the word going, okay, yep, again, yep, again, yep, again. Wow, one, two, three, line, line, line. This must be kind of a big deal. And I love it when he says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent, be all the more intense, be all the more passionate to make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things. You will never stumble. Church, we have to be able to read a letter like this from the Apostle Paul. And say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like if I do these things, if I understand what a moral excellence is, if I understand what it means to live godly, if I understand what it means to show restraint, if I understand what it means to have a knowledge, if I understand what it means to, to have brotherly kindness, if I understand what it means to live in love, if I understand this list and I do these things and I'm active in these things, are you telling me that if I really understand this, that I, I, I can never stumble? I, I'm not going to allow the enemy come trip me up? You mean, I'm, I'm not going to allow the enemy where, 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 where I just kind of drifted and I've kind of fallen back and I'm kind of stumbling right now and I haven't really been in church and I'm not reading the Bible and I really don't care about holy things and I'm just living my life, but I know that I'm stumbling. Like, are you telling me that this is true? That if I do these things, I don't have to stumble? Church, what happens when you believe the scripture and you're like, Man, I see this, and I want to believe it, and I want to apply it to my life. As much as this was true and real, when Simon Peter was inking this, it's true and real to you and me today. That we absolutely, completely, and totally have the ability to be godly in this crazy generation of godliness. Come on, let's go into our history lesson. It starts in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. Here's the history lesson. Once again, I love the Old Testament tied into the New Testament. When you're studying the Old Testament, it ties into the New Testament. And when the New Testament uh, begins to write about the Old Testament, you know that they're both inspired and written by God, by his spirit. And when you see that God used man, but it's God's words and it's God's truth. And when you see that they are intertwined, Old Testament and New Testament, both vital, both important. Old Testament points to the cross in Jesus. The New Testament points back to the cross in Jesus and both point to how, we, how we're called to live. Because those who lived in the Old Testament lived under this, this true godliness, this fear of God. That's how they lived, righteously, because they had a fear of God, and they did it right, according to what God was saying, right, Old Testament. For you and I, it's post-cross, after Jesus, we're called to live godly and do it right, according to what we know on Jesus, and understanding now the New Testament, that we have the Spirit of God within us, and what does that look like for us? So I love it when the Old Testament ties in the New Testament, New Testament ties in the Old Testament, and you've got Peter here, and he gives this amazing, amazing um, picture of a history lesson that says this. Verse 1, right here, it says this, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive, um, destructive uh, heresies, right? 
secretly introduced to you destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow after their sensuality. Sensuality, we covered this last week from Titus 2. Sensuality and the word sensual, it, it just means this free sense of, of immorality. It, it means this, this uh, gross public display of what would be immoral. I, I want you to get that, right? It's this, it's this shameful, immoral, public display of that which is considered to be immoral. Church, are we seeing things of a, a sensuality or a sensual nature be taking place where it's just widely accepted for things that are ungodly to be taking place in the public and everybody seems to accept it and push it? This is the day we're living in. This is a day we got to be aware of. This is not a day to put our head in the sand. This is not a day for us to be cowards. This is not a day for her to keep our lips shut. This is a day that we walk in a way of godliness. This is a day that we walk among those who are ungodly. This is a day that we see this stuff taking place in public and in the streets where we would see a sensuality, this behavior that is shocking on display in public. And this is happening today. And church, what, what, what does this say? Watch what it says in a warning to this. In the way of truth, sensuality, because of them, in the way of truth will be maligned. And their greed, they will exploit you false words. And their judgment, watch this, watch this, they will exploit in you false words. And their judgment from long ago, here's a history lesson, their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. I love where Peter is in this. He's like, hey guys, hey, I'm writing this. Guys, listen. All of the immorality that's taking place, all of that sensuality, all of, all of that, that, that show that's happening that is a disgrace, but it's happening publicly and it's widely accepted, it was happening in his day. And he's like, hey, just to remind you, punishment hasn't gone idle. Just to remind you, judgment is still effective today. Judgment didn't fall asleep. Man, if we need this, we need this now. And we need to hear this to be reminded, same God yesterday, today, and forever. Same God from Genesis 1. Same God from all through Genesis where you see, and we're going to get the lesson here in a minute, that God punished disobedience and God punished those who lived ungodly lives. There was punishment for that. And Peter was like, hey, same God. He's not asleep. He didn't go idle. And I love where he's writing this to say, hey, church, pay attention. Watch this. He goes into this, this, this lesson, verse four. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, if God did not spare angels, and he's speaking of when, the, when Lucifer, who is one of the top angels, Lucifer we know as Satan, when Lucifer turned against God, pride set in, said, I want to be like God. God kicked him out of heaven. And with that, a third of the angels, Lucifer was able to, to deceive a third of the angels. Get this, when you understand, we said in the beginning, when you get John 8, 44, you had these angels in absolute perfection, messengers of God, created by God. It's incredible. And even Lucifer had the ability to deceive a third of them. Like Satan knows what he's doing in the sense of deception. Satan deceived Adam and Eve in the perfect, perfect setting without sin. Church, when you look at the lies and the confusion of this day, you see a freedom in drugs. You see, uh, we, we gained a victory in Roe versus Wade. That was amazing. That it went from a federal thing to a state thing. And then immediately the liberals pushed so, so hard. Said, okay, we got to gain some ground back. And they went right after same-sex marriage. And now it's, now it's no longer state to state, but it's now federal. And they flipped that. And it's just like, what is happening? And you see everything with this transgender. You see what's happening in the schools and the children. And what's, you're like, it's just, there's such, such confusion. Man, I'm one to put things back on God to say, God, what is happening now? Like, God, why, why, 
Why can't we do something? God, would you please do something? God, we need to protect our children. God, we need to see marriages, man and a woman. God, would you do something? And, and it's amazing because I truly have been convicted on this. And it's just been one of those whispers that God would just speak to me. He said, Sean, why aren't you doing something? You're my ambassador. You're the one who represents me. The church has called me my hands and feet. The church has called to protect the kids. The church is called to look at justice. We see a justice system that nobody, nobody has consequences to really bad actions. There are very evil people out there that are getting away with whatever they want because there's no consequences because we're weak in our justice system. And you look at this and we just need to really truly care and live in such a way that we show love, that we live in such a way. No, I will live godly among the godless and just maybe they will see something in me and they will repent from their sin and they will turn and they will come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And then they become ambassadors and then they begin to live a life that matters. Sean, why aren't you doing anything? Listen, church. It is my heart this year that we take this message and say it's time to buckle up. And it's time to be a warrior. And it's time to not really be too concerned about the opinions of people. And I'm not saying in a weird way, like a good name is better than wealth. Your reputation, it does matter. You better care about your reputation. But if you're walking godly compared to the godless and you're worried about what the godless thinks and that hinders you being godly, that's what I'm talking about. but we're called to have a good reputation. And we're called to love, and one of the greatest levels of love is to speak truth. And then he goes into this and says, listen, even if it's the angels, for God didn't even spare the angels, and he put them in the pit of darkness, reserved for judgment. The second one is this. Did not God, did, did not, and did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the, upon the world. Listen, a, when he brought a flood, a, a flood upon the world to the ungodly. Like, when you see that, that Old Testament, New Testament combined, when you see that the flood wasn't a fairy tale, well, like it's been sold as well, it's just a, it's a good story, it's a fairy tale. No, it's a very real event. Genesis 6 is real. It really took place. God looked at mankind, millions of people on the earth at this time, and found one man, one family that was righteous, one family that stood godly, one family that would preach righteousness. We know he went to people. Listen, listen, it's coming. It's coming. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. The rain is going to fall. God said he's going to wipe out everybody unless you repent. And nobody listened. Not one. Nobody listened. Not a million. The whole world flooded. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine what that looked like for Noah and, and how bad, how horrible and evil and disgusting and sensual and immoral that the Bible says that every man's heart, that's man and woman, every person's heart was evil to the core and their thought was evil continuously. Could you imagine what that looked like? where God Almighty, creator of all things, said, I am sorry that I even made man. What? And Peter's like, hey guys, there's a history lesson here. God's gonna judge the ungodly. And if you're the only one, keep preaching. Could you imagine Noah going tent to tent, person to person, family to family, whatever he, as much ground as he could cover as a preacher of righteousness. And God's judgment came for the ungodly. And we see verse 6, it says this, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction and reduced them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives. There's the ungodly, the ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, there's that word sensual. There is that shocking behavior by unprincipled men. That public display 
judgment of that is God turned Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities just to ashes. Come on, turn to Jude, please. Second to last book in the New Testament. Again, Jude is written by half-brother of Jesus. Jude has no claim to fame. Jude has no bragging rights to Jesus. You had Jude and James, two half-brothers of Jesus. James wrote, James, we, we know that, that two of them came to faith. And we believe that as Jude is a half-brother of Jesus, we see where Jude just simply says this, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He didn't make any claim, special treatment. I'm his half-brother. He said, no, I'm a slave. I've surrendered. I know who he is. He's my Lord. He makes no special claim in his letter that he was someone special, that he has more authority, that he grew up with Jesus and that gives him, you know, some type of credit. He's like, no, nah, I'm just a slave. I belong to him. I know who he is. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called beloved. That, I love it. He's writing this to us and God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May, I love it. This is what he says. Same thing as Peter. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. I love this. What if we spoke in this type of language? May mercy and peace and love be multiplied. Man, let it rip. Let's multiply our mercy for one another, our compassion for one another. Let us multiply that peace that gains within. Let us multiply our true love for one another. Let that multiply. Like even if that's just this year, God, let mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I'm making every, making every effort to write about the common salvation, I felt necessary to write, and watch this, to a appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which is once for all handed down to the saints for certain persons have crept in unnoticed you've got to watch this certain persons have crept in unnoticed those who long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly persons there it is again ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into lusciousness lusciousness your version may say NIV says a, a, a true license for immorality well, when you see the ease of immorality, when you see that we have been granted this license to be immoral, it's okay, it's accepted, it's no big deal, don't trust the Bible, don't trust those Christians, they don't know what they're doing, they're not caught up on the times. Why, why do they think it's so difficult? Why, why do they think that marriage, that sex before marriage is wrong? Why do they think it's such a big deal to look at pornography? Why do they think that, that, that the same-sex relationships would be immoral? Why? Like, it's just a license to sin. We're good with that. It's a license to be. This is what he's talking about. Church, we got to get back to a place of a moral excellence. We as the church as a whole, and I'm talking about the church, Believer's Chapel, yes, we're a sliver of the church, but the church has to get back to a moral excellence. The church has to get back to what it means to say, listen, I'm going to save myself. I want to be a virgin until marriage. I believe that. I'm going to get into that. Man, I'm going to own that. I believe that sex before marriage is fornication. I believe that that's sin. I believe pornography is sin. I believe same-sex relationship is sin. I believe this, and we see this in immorality. But today's day and age, man, you're one of how many? You stand alone in that. Because this nation has come to a place of just sex is easy and sex is everywhere. And it's pushed so much in everything. It is pushed, it is pushed, it is pushed, it is pushed so much so that they think they have a license for immorality. And right after this, Jude gives us this beautiful history lesson again, and he says this. Now I desire to remind you, watch this, I desire to remind you, I desire to remind you Though you know all things, once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed all those who did not believe. So he goes into a history lesson here about those uh, God's chosen people. 
Israel, God's chosen people. You know the story. He freed them from Egypt. This was a big deal. Miracle after miracle, plague after plague after plague. This was a big deal. You know, hey, let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Moses, Aaron, spokesperson for the Lord. Man, miracle after miracle after miracle. The people are released. They get to the sea. The sea splits. It's amazing. Millions of people crossing the sea. Oh, yo, Pharaoh changes his mind. Everybody on the chariots are coming back after him. God says, watch, watch, watch. Wham! Just slams all the water back on all the chariots. A big, huge, amazing, incredible, miraculous victory. And these people are now free. They're free from slavery. They begin to complain. They begin to murmur. They begin to say, man, you brought us out here to die. We don't have anything to eat. We were better off in slavery. Can you imagine that? Miracle after miracle after miracle. And then finally you get to the promised land. You're right there. You're on the threshold, 11 miles away. You're ready to go. Come on, take over. God says, I've given you this land. Give me 12 spies. Go in and check the land. It's your land. I'm giving it to you. You've gone through the whole sense of the freedom. You've been slaves and I brought you to the promised land. Send 12 in, 12 come back. 10 of them are like, no way. Do you see how big they were? Do you know who we're gonna have to fight? Two of them, Joshua and Caleb like, hey, no, we got this. We're right here. We're so close. Come on, remember what took place? Remember we were in, 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 we were in slavery? Remember all we did was bang on bricks? Remember we would get beaten? Remember we would get whipped? Remember that all of God did? We're his people, man. We're his chosen people. And he set us free. And he's brought us right to this place. You think he's forgotten us? All that he did. And you don't think God's got us this much more. We're right there. And the 10 convinced the millions. In the history lesson, God subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. God made it very clear. Because of your unbelief, I brought you all this way. You're my people. You're so close to the promised land. And you gave up. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The ones who are 20 and under, except for Joshua and Caleb, just two, the ones 20 and under will make it. From 20 and above, from 21 and above, you're all going to perish. What? We got to stop thinking God plays around with sin. We, we got to get our head out of the sand, church, because we live in a, a generation that isn't accountable to anything. We live in a generation that, that the word respect doesn't mean anything to them. We live in a generation where they are takers, 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 takers. We live in a generation that they have a license to sin. We live in a generation that is just crazy in the streets. We live in a generation that there's no consequences. We live in a generation that what happens, what happens when you and I make the decision to say, I'm going to live godly among the godless. If I'm the only one, if I'm that Joshua, if I'm that Caleb, I'm going to trust God. If you know God's called you to something and you're just this close. Come on, everyone, just look at me just for a minute, man. If you know that God has called you to something, it's been a battle to get there, man. It's been a fight to get there. you know you're this close. You can't stop. If you know, they knew God called them to the promise. They knew that. That wasn't up to question. The, the, the question never came up. Maybe God doesn't want us to go. No, that never came up. No, God called you to the promised land. You're that close. The doubt is on you. Your confusion is on you. That, that, that's the problem here with I'm so close to the promised land. 
They never said God didn't call us to this. They're like, ah, slavery was better. Are you kidding me? Getting pounded in the face, having whip cracked across your back, working for nothing, like that's better than being so close, so close. You're one fight away. That's where they were. They were a battle away from the promised land. Church, you might be one fight away. You might be one battle away. You're right there. You're right there. You're right there. We can't walk in doubt. When you know God's called you to something, these were his chosen people. God says, 21 and above, you're out. You're going to die in the wilderness. That's, that's New Testament. That's, that's Jude going, hey, what did he say? I'm, do, I'm writing this to remind you. I'm writing this to remind you. Don't mess around. Church, hear me. Don't go light on sin. Don't go light on your personal sin or the sins of this nation. You don't think we're going to get judged for the millions of babies, the millions and millions and millions and millions up to 70 that have been murdered? You don't think God's going to judge that one day? We cannot go light on this. And you personally could be one battle away. Don't doubt. Don't walk in disbelief. Come on, my time is up. I just got a short thing. And then he goes again. Second and third thing here, he talks about the angels again, same angels. And then he, again, he speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, the same way indulged in gross immorality, went after strange flesh, exhibited as an example of undergoing punishment of eternal fire. Like, you can't get away from same God yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, you could have First Timothy up on the screen, please. We'll close with this. I want you to see this, please. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose. I love this. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself. Now, what is it to walk in a discipline? Was it to say, okay, I'm going to discipline myself for the purpose of godliness. I know that I need to walk godly amongst the ungodly. I see what's going on in this generation. I see what's happening. I see the decay. I see the fall. Man, but I have to discipline my, if I'm going to be the only one, I have to be disciplined in my lane of godliness. I have to be disciplined. I have to be devoted. I have to walk in this high level of devotion to a reverence and respect and fear of God that shows up my holiness and my purity. My conduct really matters and I got to be devoted to this. I got to be disciplined in this because I watch this. This is why, because I know, I know that in the midst of all the crazy, yet there's still a harvest. In the midst of all that's wrong, there's still those who will come to Christ. And all the, man, who's called to do that, church? Who's called to discipline themselves for the, for the, for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, for all things, since it holds promise, what, in the present life. That's now. That's now. Church, what's it look like for you and I? Say, God, I am called to discipline myself to this life of godliness. No, I didn't go hide. When you understand this, Abraham, he begged God. God, if you could find 40 in Sodom and Gomorrah, if you could just find, he begged God that some would come to Christ, would some would walk in, in fear. Old Testament, you'd walk in, in fear of God. Found none, but he tried. He kept going. Noah kept preaching. What happens when you identify this world church, this world needs Jesus. This world needs Jesus. They need life and they need hope and they need truth and they need love. What truly is love? Love is truth. It's us speaking truth and love with grace, but yet truth, but yet truth. It's not love to lie to somebody. Oh no, your sin's fine. Nope, you're okay. No, you, I love you. No, that's not love. That's deception. Church, we're people who are called to stand devoted in our godliness even if you're the only one. 
Noah was the only one. Abraham was the only one. Lot, we don't know what Lot was doing. Lot was righteous. Whether he was preaching, we don't know what Lot was doing. We know Noah was, and we know Abraham was. What about you? This church will be evangelical. This church has always been and always will be after the souls of God's created people. It is God's desire for all to be saved. We will be godly. We will stand our ground. We will be firm. We will love, but we will speak truth. People need Jesus. People need Jesus. Come on, if you could just stand to your feet, please. Come on. As we sing, if you need prayer for any reason, I ask that you would come up and we would love, we would love to pray with you. We'd love to pray over you if you need anything.